we're looking verse by verse, but we're almost finished with the chapter. Now, the last two weeks, we were looking at the issue of in his times. So I'm going to read a few verses, and we'll have a word of prayer. 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verse number 15, it says, Which in his time, speaking of the Lord Jesus, he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's pray. Let's stop right there. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life, his resurrection life. We thank you for his life given to us on Calvary's cross, where he shed his precious innocent blood for our sins. Father, we thank you for the gospel of grace that says it's no works of our own that are required today, but everything what Jesus Christ did at Calvary and our faith in, in that and in him that saves us today. Father, we thank you for the Apostle Paul given to us Gentiles, for, to the nations, to teach us about your Son, our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus, as far as the revelation of the mystery. We thank you for the Holy Scriptures that lay out uh, the life of Jesus Christ uh, through, the, through the lens of the Apostle Paul. May we continue to grow in those things as those are the things that we're going to be judged on at the judgment seat of Christ and all of your word rightly divided. We ask as we study the word today with those of like precious faith that you give us great insight, understanding, and wisdom. And as always, give us a greater appreciation of your son, the Lord Jesus. It's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so last time we looked at the dispensation of fullness of times. When God ends this present dispensation of grace with the rapture, the next dispensation, Ephesians 1.10, is the dispensation of fullness of times. Now, we did a whole study on that. If you missed that, Ryan will post it eventually, okay? But we're going to move on. That issue of in his times, look at verse 15. <coughs> It says, which in his times, and what we saw is, he's going to start in the heavens with the body of Christ, and then he's going, to, he's going to then bring his justice and his kingdom to the earth through the nation of Israel. That's why verse 15 says, he shall show. He's not showing it now. The God of this world, Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the prince of this world, he's running this world. I don't have to remind you guys that. Just look around. Look, turn to you. It's a mess out there. Well, that's because Satan is in charge of this world. But notice in verse 15, in his times, there's times coming where the Lord Jesus will take back rule and reign from the heaven of the heavens from Satan as well as the earth. Okay, that's coming. We went over that. It says he will show, verse number 15, who is the blessed and only potentate. That means great almighty power, Jesus Christ. And then he says the king of kings and then also the Lord of lords. He will delegate authority. The reason why God created the body of Christ is so he can delegate authority in the heavens. Jesus Christ will reign over the heavens through us. Us joint heirs with Christ who, who, who suffer with him now will also be glorified. We're going to reign with him in his heavenly kingdom. He's the king of kings. There are going to be other kings and thrones. That's what the body of Christ in the heavens. And then on the earth with Israel. And then Lord of lords. Lords mean righteous judges. We're going to make righteous judgments on his behalf. I just wanted to show you something about that King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Uh, go with me to Acts chapter 7. Go back to the book of Acts. In Acts 7, Stephen, a Jewish man who uh, is a member of the little flock of Israel, he's a part of the believing remnant, okay? He was a, a prominent man in that Jewish kingdom program that Christ sets up on the earth. Uh, he's speaking to the religious leaders of Israel. And he's speaking about Moses, and we're going to take a look at that. And that issue of king of kings and lord of lords. Look at Acts chapter 7 and verse 27. Acts 7 verse 27. King of kings and lord of lords. Acts chapter 7 and verse 27 says, But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Now, why, the reason I want to show you this, when Moses was in Egypt, he grew up, everybody knows the story, I hope, that Pharaoh, the Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, said that the people of the Hebrews are growing too much. And they're growing so fast, if, if our enemies come and have war, these people can fight against us. So he said, let's kill all the male children. So they slew all the Hebrew male children. And Moses' mother, by faith, put him in an ark, a little bulrush, put him in the Nile River, and Pharaoh's daughter got him and said, spare this one, Father, and I'll raise him up as my own. And that ended up being Moses. But Moses knew that he was Hebrew. You know, I was telling you that 
when 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 uh, you, you see some of these um, Muslims who come not just right over from America. We were in Minnesota. There's a lot of Somali Muslims, and a young 19-year-old Somali Muslim. He he's a jihadist. He stabbed 19 people at a uh, at a mall, and they want to blow up the Mall of America and all this other stuff. But he wasn't born overseas. His parents were. He was born right there in Minnesota. But but what, what was going on in his heart? And you see this as you, they talk to these people. They they even though they were born here in America, they still have this allegiance to their homeland and to their home thinking about jihad and, and, and Sharia law. That's what was going on with Moses. Moses was born to Hebrews, but he was raised by the Egyptians. And yet it never left him that he was a Hebrew. He always had that in his heart, okay? That's what's going on. It says, but, but notice what it says in verse 27. Well, I got just to get the context, look at verse number um, 22. Go back to 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. So you guys understand, he was a Hebrew, but he was actually raised an Egyptian. He was one of the princes of Egypt. And was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was a full 40 years old, now watch this, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Now at this time, the Israelis were slaves of the Egyptians. And Moses was tasked with, watch, with oversight of them. Okay, now watch this. It says, verse 24, so, so in, in the, we'll go back in Exodus and see it. Two Hebrews are fighting each other, okay? Look at verse 24. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian, okay? So at this, at, at this time, uh, this, is, this is actually before that, he sees an Egyptian being harsh to one of the Hebrews, so he kills the Egyptian. We'll look at that. Verse 25. For he supposed his brethren would have understood, now get this, how that God by his hand would deliver them. Think about this. As he's being raised in Egypt under the, uh, as a prince, something in his heart, God was working on his heart. That as, as his own mother whispered, what was cool about that, when his mother gave birth to him and put him in the river, she wasn't just losing, she wasn't losing her son. Because if you remember what happens, her young daughter Miriam, Moses' sister, she is the handmaiden of the of the of Pharaoh's daughter. She tells Pharaoh's daughter, "Look, you need a nurse to nurse that baby." She wasn't pregnant. She couldn't you know, milk the baby, you know, get a baby milk. She goes, "I know a Hebrew woman who could nurse that baby for you," and it was her mother, Moses' mother. So she got her baby back. And by the way, they paid her to do it. They gave her money. Yeah, it was awesome. She gave him to God, and, and she got him back and got paid for it. That was the end of it. But that was of God. But they, he thought, and, and, and I'm sure as his mother talked to him about the God of the, his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all that stuff stayed in his heart. What you tell children, it stays with them, okay? So it stayed with Moses. But see, in verse 25, his people, they understood not. So now the next day, so he kills the Egyptian. Now two of his brethren are fighting, verse 26. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove. Speaking of two Hebrews. And would have set them at one again. Notice Moses is constantly trying to bring peace. Moses was a peacemaker. Notice he says, saying, sirs, ye are brethren. He's talking to fellow Hebrews. Why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong. By the way, it's always the one who, who's in the wrong who's got something to say, right? Mm -hmm. This guy is going to try to rebuke Moses. Notice what he said. But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? That's what it means to be a king and a lord. The king is the ruler, but the lord, the lord means a righteous judge. And that's what he's saying. Verse 28, wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? So he threatens Moses, because under Egypt law, I just heard one, one of the Saudi Arabia uh, royal family was put to death just recently in our, in our time. And the reason he was put to death is because he killed someone. He murdered someone. And even though he was part of the royal family, like Moses was there, they, they, they put him to death. And so that was, the, that was the custom over there in the Middle East. Go back, if you will, to Exodus. Go back to Exodus. That issue of who made thee a ruler or judge. Go back to Exodus chapter number 
Exodus chapter number 2. Hold your hand there in, in Acts and go back to Exodus. So that issue of ruler and judge, Genesis, Exodus, the second book, Exodus chapter 2. And as you can tell by the name, this is when it, Israel uh, as it makes an exodus or exit out of Egypt. Okay, That's how they got out of Egypt. Look at Exodus chapter number 2 and look at verse 11. This is the account that Stephen is, is, is recounting. Verse number 11. Exodus 2.11. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, he was 40 years old, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. Moses' compassion saw that they were being treated ill with, had ill will done to them, evil and treated by the Egyptian. Verse 11. And he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he saw an Egyptian hitting one of his, 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 his kids. Verse 12. And he looked this way and that way. I like when he records that. Mm -hmm. Moses looking he's out. out. He's checking out. <laughs> Making sure the coast is clear, right? He was about to kill him. He's, yeah, he's about to kill him. Watch this. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Now, he's over in the sands of Egypt. He just dug a hole for him in the sand like, like the mob does in Las Vegas. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you won't find him in the Vegas desert. Verse 13. And when he went out the second day, Behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow, your brother? Verse 14. And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. By the way, this is what happened to make Moses leave Egypt. And for the next 40 years, he went out to Saudi Arabia there, to Midian, and he was a, he went from being a, ki a king or a prince, a, a, a heir to the throne. He went to be a, a humble shepherd. Mm -hmm. He just kept the sheep of his father-in-law for 40 years. He, he was a nobody. He went from being somebody to nobody. God humbled him. Mm -hmm. See, before God can use you, you have to be humble. You know that? Mm -hmm. It always happens that way in Scripture. Before God can, before God can mildly use you, you got to be humble. And Moses, it took 40 years, and then God called him back at 80 years old. But I want you to see that issue of a ruler, God's going to have princes. Go back to uh, Acts chapter 7. Jesus Christ will delegate authority. Go back to Acts chapter 7. Acts 7, look at verse 35. Acts 7, 35. After, humbling God, after God humbling Moses... Guess what he did? Verse 35. This Moses whom they refused. Now Moses is a type of the Lord Jesus. Stephen is saying, y'all know how you rejected Jesus? He's just like Moses. This Moses whom they, the Hebrews, refused, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge? That's a king of kings and lord of lords. The same did God sent to be ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. In other words, Forty years in the wilderness, God then sent that same Moses back to be that ruler and judge over Israel. Well, Jesus Christ our Lord is going to do that with the body of Christ in the heavenly places, and he's going to do it with the nation of Israel in the, on the earth. Go to the book of Colossians. Go to Colossians chapter 1. The reason why you are here today is so that you can learn God's word through the Apostle Paul and the rightly divided word, so that you might qualify to reign with him, to be those kings and princes and princesses and queens, the, those, to be those rulers that he has, has desired for us to be and designed the body to be. That's why we learn the word of God. We want to qualify for that rulership. Notice in verse 16, Colossians 1, 16. For by him, speaking of the Lord Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. That's the two spheres of God's kingdom. The first verse of your Bible, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Watch this. Visible and invisible. See, we can see the things here on earth. And God gave us this eyesight to see what goes on on earth so that we can understand the invisible, the things we can't see yet. We can see them by faith because the Bible tells us, but we can't see in the heavens. It's a spiritual realm. It's a different dimension. We can't see it, but it's real. Just as real as this one. Even more so because God's there. Watch this. Whether they be, verse 16, the first thing he mentions is thrones. 
funny. I've never seen it, but I hear people talk about it when I'm driving around. I mean, even some of my seniors, there's a show called Game of Thrones. Show, yeah. It's crazy, they tell me, but yeah. I don't know. But Game of Thrones, it's all, it's all about who's going to be in charge. It's all about It's all about who's going to be in charge. And Jesus Christ is the all-powerful, and he's going to delegate the authority to the people he wants. Thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now, he hasn't realized it's a rain delay, R-E-I-G-N. It's, it's delayed, but with the rapture, he's going to begin to have his day, right? We saw that at the dispensation of fullness of time. Go back to 1 Timothy. So be patient. Everything on this world, we know it's getting worse. The, po the politics of this world is crazy. The, the, all all the, the strife in the Middle East. All that stuff will change one day when Jesus Christ comes. But before he fixes the earth, he's going to fix the heavens first. Okay? And he's going to do it through us. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse number 16. Now when he says, Who only have immortality... Uh, the word immortality, mortal means subject to death. All of us here, and those who listen to the sound of my voice, this flesh we have, I just came back from Minnesota to do a funeral just a couple weeks ago. As, as I'm doing her eulogy, Sister Dina, her body was right there. But I told the people attending, I said, her, her soul is not there. Her spirit and soul, they're with the Lord. That's just her human, her, her physical flesh. Her flesh died, okay? That's what mortal means, subject to death. And when it says about Jesus Christ, who only hath immortality, he's still human now. He's both human and God. He's 100% man, 100% God. He's the man Christ Jesus, Paul called him. But he's the only human being who has a body that will not die, that cannot die. Each and every one of us, even when he raised people from the dead, in our John study on, on Wednesday, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead in John 11. But Lazarus died again. Lazarus wasn't born with a, he wasn't raised with a glorious body. He had his same human body and he died again. Okay? Each and every one of us, if the Lord tarries another hundred years, all of us will be dead. We'll be with the Lord. And our bodies will be cremated, buried, whatever, right? Lost at sea. I don't know. Don't go on a cruise ship. You might fall over and be lost at sea. But your soul will be with the Lord. See, here's the point. He's the only one who has immortality. He's not subject to death, okay? Now, go back to chapter number, because that won't always be the case. He's going to share that with others. Go back, if you will, to chapter number 1. Look at verse 17. Chapter number 1 of 1 Timothy, verse 17. When Paul calls him this, we saw this in, our, in, in, in chapter 1 in our study. Now into the king eternal, okay? He's going to reign forever. By the way, king eternal, that means forever. Immortal. Jesus Christ has a human body that will never die. That's why, that's why when it says he shall reign on the throne of his father David forever. See, Jesus Christ owns both heaven and earth. <clears throat> Yet he's promised by God to the people of Israel, to the earth. So his physical body, flesh and bone, will actually reside down here on the earth. He will be in Jerusalem, Israel. Okay? But how, so how will he reign over the heavens? Oh, the vast creation of God. That's through us. That's what the body of Christ was created for. We're going to reign with him, but in the heavenly places. But he, he right now, notice verse 17, now unto the king eternal, immortal, notice invisible, the only wise God. Now after he's been glorified, Paul now refers to him in his humanity and his deity. Think about that. Paul has given him his full humanity, immortality. God the Father, he's a spirit, so he has no body. God the Son has a body, an immortal body, not subject to death. But notice, invisible, there's his, his attributes of deity, and I'll show you why he says invisible. It means to humanize, because he's so bright you can't look at him. Much to it. Invisible, the only wise God... It's all about wisdom. Who's, who's the wisest, Satan or God? Well, we know God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Now, what, what happens to you and I who believe on the Lord Jesus? Well, look at verse number 10. First, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Start at verse 9. 2 Timothy 1, 9. Who hath saved us? Speaking of the Lord Jesus. And called us with an holy calling. 
Not according to our works. You've got to get people to realize you're saved today, not according to your works. It's by grace alone, through faith. His, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus. Now, when Paul calls him Christ Jesus, not Jesus Christ. When he calls him Christ Jesus, he's focusing on his cross work. He suffered for this privilege, okay? Which was given us in Christ Jesus. Notice when? Before the world began. The mystery, even though revealed to Paul, later in, in, in human history, God actually had it in mind before he created anything. Before the world began. But, verse 10, but is now made manifest by the appearing, that's when Christ appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, of our Savior Jesus Christ, there's this person, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. When Jesus Christ died and God raised him from the dead, he was the first fruits of them that sleep. In other words, that, that feast of first fruits that the Jews practiced in the law of Moses, Passover was a type of his death on the cross. He shed the blood of the Lamb. So every time they did Passover, it was a type to show them, okay, that's what Messiah has to do. He has to be the Lamb who died, right? Uh, behold the Lamb of God, which taken away the sin of the world. Then he had to be buried. So that's unleavened bread. You put sin away. You bury it. So that's the second feast, unleavened bread. But then that third feast, was called first fruits, and you come up out of the, the out of the grave, out of the ground. Israel was to get the first fruits out of the ground that God blessed them with to God, and so Jesus Christ comes out of the ground. That's why today we bury people six feet under. People don't understand that they they don't think about that. Six is the number of man, and they bury people six feet under, waiting for the resurrection. That's what that's type. That's what's going on. So when they bury somebody six feet under, six is the number of man. That's where all men go but ready to be raised again, okay? Mm -hmm. God gives you a, a, a glimpse of this every time you go to sleep, too. The Bible says death for the believer is sleep. So think about it. Somebody goes to sleep, and they can, look, they, can, they can sleep so hard they look dead, but then they raise up. That is a picture of death and resurrection. God put that in humanity for us to go to sleep. We didn't have to go to sleep. God made that happen. He did that to Adam, and it's a type of the resurrection. Every time you wake up from sleep, it's a type of resurrection. God is reminding humans, you're going to die, but you're going to be raised again. Okay. Now watch this. He says, look at verse number 10. He's abolished death. So when he rose from the dead, he's the first fruit of that. And hath brought life, everlasting life, and immortality. For those of us who trust him, we're going to get bodies that never die again. I miss Dina. His... Her husband, Paul, and her children, nine, ten-year-old, she just turned ten, uh, September 30th, ten-year-old Izzy and five-year-old Beniah, they know they're going to see their mom again because of the word of God. Their fa mother and father taught them that. Paul's like, Ron, I can't even really cry. And I go, you don't sorrow like those who have no hope. He says, I know I'm going to see my wife again. The, the, the children know this. I go, yes, look at that. He has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. What gospel? Paul's gospel. Verse 11. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. That's Paul's gospel. And the gospel of grace lets us know that as Jesus Christ rose from the dead, so too will those of us who are in Christ. We're going to get immortal bodies. We'll never die again. Okay? All right. Go back to 1 Timothy 6. So right now in verse 16, he's the only one. He's the only human who has immortality. But remember, Paul also talks about his deity. Notice what he says in verse 16. Dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be glory, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. When he talks about dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, think about the sun. It says that when he appeared to Paul, he was brighter than the noonday sun. You can't look, you can't stare directly in the sun without something. Your, your human eyes, God made it, you can't stare directly without it hurting you. Imagine a light greater than that. That's the light of Almighty God. Let me show you some things uh, from the scripture. He, he, he literally is, has, has the glory of God himself because he's the son of God. Uh, go over to Psalm 104. Look, go back to the book of Psalms. Psalm 104. 
Psalm 104. You know, there, there's a theory or principle called the gap principle. I, I get questions. In fact, I got, I got one guy who just asked me about that, my opinion on it. And, and there's some brothers who did some good stuff, more decent stuff. And, and, and what that means is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And then the next verse says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. But when you read about God, everything about him is, is light and creativity and life, not some dead, void, darkness. That's, that's, that's satanic. That, that is, um, when you see that in the Bible, that's like the wrath of God. That, that's punishment. So you say, well, how do you get to him creating things all of a sudden everything is dark and, and, and without void and stuff? And then you got a verse from Jeremiah saying, when the wrath of God hits the Middle East, that's how it's going to be, without form of war. So that's wrath. Because God himself is light. There was some type of satanic rebellion that God judged is what happened in Genesis 1. So they get, but, but look, it's verses like this. Let me show you Psalm 104. Look at verse 1 and 2. Psalm 104, verse 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Who covers thyself with what? Light, as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. What I want you to see there is that when, when it comes to God, if you can see God, it would just be bright light. Okay? That's God. But when he says you can't approach unto, that light is so powerful, you can't even be in his presence without him helping you. You come to the presence or dim it or something. He has to be, he has to do it for you. Mankind on their own cannot be in God's presence because of sin. It's the light of his holiness. He's so holy that, by the way, there are creatures that stand before them and they cover their feet and cover their faces before God. And they don't sin. That's how holy he is. They just kind of use that. They cover themselves because he's so holy. The light of God. And that's who Jesus Christ is. Uh, go to Exodus. Go back to Exodus chapter 33. Just let's look at some things from Scripture. So when he talks about that light we can't approach him, he's, he's talking about his deity. The Lord is man, but he's also God. But he's the glory of God. Uh, by the way, Adam had that glory before he, he sinned. When it says that they were both naked and not ashamed, because they dwelt in light, they had God's light, glory, and then they lost it. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 33. That's when I say they, Adam and Eve, after they sinned. Look at Exodus chapter 33. Interesting Moses wants to see God. Not just in a burning bush, but actually he says, God, just show me yourself. And the answer from God is very interesting. Look at Exodus 33, verse 20. Uh, verse number 18. Exodus 33, 18. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Nice request, right? Hey, God, can I see your glory? Uh -uh. And he said... I will make all my goodness, this is the glory of God, my goodness pass before you. That's why Paul, when Paul says, for all of sin comes short of the glory of God, we're not as good as God. God is good. Notice, I, I let all my, make all my goodness pass before thee. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. Definitely a character of Almighty God, graciousness. And show mercy and compa that is compassion. Paul uses the word compassion. Mercy on my show. So those are those those are things that only God has. That's why Jesus said, "There's there's only one good." He, they say, "Good master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life?" He says, "There's only one good, but God." He says, "Are you calling me God? You understand what you're saying there?" The guy says, "Yep." Watch this, verse twenty. And he said, "Thou canst not see my face." I love this answer. For there shall no man see me in what. You just die and you just would disintegrate because of your sin. And me too. We'd be consumed by his glorious light. Consumed. I know. Wow, right? Go to, go to John chapter 1, verse 18. That's the holiness of God. And people, people mock God because of his grace and stuff. That's crazy, man. When you stand in his presence at Judgment Day in your little sin, all butt naked, like this, shivering. Yeah. Yeah. People, man, I'm telling you, they, they, they need to have, 
They need to have a fear and reverence of Almighty God. Just because he's not pouring out his wrath right now don't mean he won't. We were talking about Matthew. Remember we were talking about people say, God is love. God is love. Yeah, he is. God is justice too. And his justice is just as strong as his love. He will judge your sin. That's the reason Jesus had to come, because God is serious about sin. Notice in ch ch chapter 1 of John, verse 18. John chapter 1, verse 18. No man have seen God at any time. He's just talking human beings. You can't physically even see God because of his glory. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Colossians 1, Paul says he's the image of the invisible God. Mankind can't put their eyes on God because of the glory and the holiness of God. But they can see Jesus Christ. Um, go to Acts chapter 9. You and John, go over to the book of Acts chapter 9. Now, in prophecy, God's glory is equated to the sun. That's you in. When God created the sun that warms the planet, that gives light, he and him, he was thinking about his son. He's thinking about God the Son. The son, it, isn't it interesting? Son S U N and Son S O N. It's, it's no, it's no coincidence that they're very close. The Son, not seeing the Son, because every time you look at the Son, God wants you to think Jesus Christ, the bright and morning star. He's called. So every time you look at the Son, think, oh, that's Lord Jesus. Just, it just type of him. That's what it is. Give light. Now watch this. When he was glorified at the Mount of Transfiguration, it says he shone as the sun, which is bright, right? You can get blinded by the sun. But there's a light greater than the sun, and that's the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection from heaven's glory. Watch this. Look at Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 2. Acts 9, verse 2. This is Saul, Paul being saved on the road to Damascus. Verse 2. And, and I and desired of him, speaking of the high priest, letters to Damascus, to the synagogues. That if he, that Saul, found any of this way, any of those Jews who believed Jesus was their Messiah, whether they were men or women, the fact that he went after women, you know what makes ISIS and all these guys just so brutal? Because most of the time, they won't kill the women and children, or they won't hunt. Mm -mm. These religious zealots like Saul was, they don't care if you're a woman or a child, they can kill you too. That's, that's brutality there. Yeah. He might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a what? A light from heaven. Now you would say, oh, okay, a light from heaven. But as you look through the book of Acts, two, two extra accounts, it was, it was more than just a light from heaven. Go to chapter 22. By the way, that light is the Lord Jesus, so you've got to look at the other passages as well. Paul's going to give an account of this. In Acts 9, you have Luke account, Luke's account of Paul's salvation. In Acts 22 and 26, you have Paul recounting. People say, Brother Ron, how can I share this message of grace with people? I say, first of all, you've got to make sure they're saved. Don't talk to them about right division unless they're, you, you, you make sure they're saved by the, Paul's gospel. But then, when you, when you understand they're saved, you can show them the same thing Paul did. Go back to when he got saved on the road to Damascus. When Paul wanted to talk about his ministry, he goes back to his, why is Paul in your Bible for the... For the grace message, for the, for the body of Christ. Look at uh, Acts chapter 22 and verse number 6. And it came to pass that as I made my journey, I, I was come nigh unto Damascus about, oh, about what time? Noon. noon. So now we got a little more piece of the puzzle. It's noon, and if you're in the Middle East at noon, it's hot and it's bright. <laughs> noon. Watch this. Suddenly there shone from heaven a, not just a light, a what? A great light round about me. Now, the light, he's given more understanding about this light of Jesus Christ's glory. But wait, there's more. Go to Acts 26. Acts 26. Look at verse 13. And so with these three accounts, you kind of see this light, the, the, the greatness of this light. And I didn't read the rest, but these men were overwhelmed. Saul and these men were overwhelmed by the light. You know, people, t people sometimes believe that Paul had eye problems. And that very well could be. He was blind. This light was so great, he was blinded for three days. Now, it's a type of Israel and so forth. Unbelieving Israel, being blinded. 
But he himself, Saul, couldn't see for three days because the light was so bright. He was blinded. And here's why. Look at verse 13. Right at noon, verse 13. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the what? The sun. So you got the Middle Eastern sun, middle of the day. He goes, there was the sun, and then there's this light from heaven that was brighter. Notice, above the brightness of the sun, that's the glory of the Lord Jesus. You can't stand and look at the sun. There's a light greater than them, and that's the Lord Jesus in his glorious nature as God. It's so bright that it just overwhelms a man. And this was him coming down to actually talk to Saul. Imagine, as, as Paul talks about over there, go back to 1 Timothy, when he's sitting on his throne. Go, go back to 1 Timothy. He's at the right hand of the Father. That's why he says, dwelling in the light. He's right with the Father. Uh, go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. Who only hath immortality versus humanity, dwelling in the light, so he, he shares the glory of God the Father, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, speaking of uh, God, God the Father's glory, nor can see, to whom be honor and power. See, it's one thing to, to give him honor, but God the Father has given him all power, too. He's going to come back and he's going to... He, when you have power, you can force your will on other people. You can force your will. I tell Jada Lynn, she's a strong-willed child. She was born that way, been that way. I, I was like Jacob and God when she was one years old. Rest, I literally wrestled with her. I was trying to break her. She wore me out, man. I said, oh, Krista, we in trouble. I don't know why we in trouble. Mm -hmm. Now nah, we raised her up. But she's she strong-willed. But I told her, I said, the reason why you came out little and I'm big is so I'm going to force my will on you as your father. Because I'm going to train you up to, I told her, I'm going to train you up to honor God. I'm God in her life. I, God the Father made fathers, parents, but especially the father, to be like God. Because honor your father and your mother was the first commandment with promise. That it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. If you, if you didn't honor your parents, there was no way you were going to honor God. If you didn't honor your father, there was no way. So, Father, our job is to take our children and tame them so they would honor God. That's what our job is. And I tell her, I'm bigger than you, so I'm going to force you to do it. Yeah. Now I'm not going to have her do anything evil or bad But when she gets out of hand I'm going to stay on her Because I want her heart to not be rebellious against God And it's my job as her father to do that Okay, It's, it's the why job of the father That's why fathers are failing today And children are all messed up Because Children are messed up The number one cause of children being messed up Is their fathers Number one cause Fathers That's right. God said the instruction in the Bible is fathers provoke not your children to wrath, lest they be discouraged. Fathers provoke not your children to anger. It doesn't say anything to the mothers. Mothers try to that, but especially if you have boys, there's nothing you're going to do with that boy when he turns 12. Right. He's going to be running with the games. Uh -huh. You're going to be praying for him. You know, be quiet, woman. I told my mother that at 15, man, that was the worst thing I ever did. Because I was, that, that's not, I didn't know that, but you, you can't, but she couldn't do anything. She was going to hit me with a broom because I didn't. <laughs> I was on the phone with this girl, Keish. Yeah, girl, you know. My mother said, take that garbage out. I said, yeah, 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 I get to it. Take that garbage out. I get to it. I said, hold on, girl, hold on. Mama, I'm on the phone here. And I, she must have took the phone and hung up. And then she came with a broom. I took the broom away from her. And I went, watch it, woman. And I'm just, I, I, I already apologize. But that's what boys do. That stuff hardly happens. If there's a man there, he's like, boy, you... Talking to my wife like that? Oh no. You take him back and say, honey, go to go to the mall. Here's some money. Go to the mall. Me and the boy gotta have a talk. You would have been hung up with Keisha. Hmm? You would have been hung up with Keisha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So I apologize to my mother for that. But I was young and dumb, just like any 15-year-old boy. But because of that, you that's what fathers affect that. And so <clears throat> look, notice here it says, um, to whom honor and power. So Jesus Christ not only has the honor, but he has the power. And one day, that power will be realized, okay, in his time. So you want to that? Everlasting. It's going to last forever. And then he says, amen, it is truth. It is so. Now, look at verse 17. 
He says, charge them. So he, here's his last, these are his last uh, um, instructions in this epistle. Charge them. That means, as Timothy does, as the bishop have some ruling, rulership over the saints, he says, charge them, like a general would charge uh, his soldiers, charge them that are rich in this world. Now he's talking about if you're rich, you have uh, worldly riches. That they be not high-minded. Uh, I wrote some things about this. Riches can lead or produce pride in people. You know that? Mm -hmm. Because you're that self-sufficient, you think you don't need anybody, so you think you treat anybody however you want, right? Yeah. And use people. So riches can produce pride. And that's why he says, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. If you're a believer and you have riches, you're not to look down on other people because you're rich and they're poor. That's what he reminded They do. They do. And what, what the warning is, I wrote something. I said, there's so many warnings in Scripture concerning those that are rich. Go back to verse 10. Go, go uh, verse 9. Go back to 1 Timothy 6, 9. But they that will be rich, if, if your desires become rich, God is going to tell you what's going to happen to you. Fall into temptation and a snare. You'll be tempted to do all types of things that are offensive to God and a snare, a trap. Mm -hmm. And into many foolish, foolish because you, you're not thinking, hmm, maybe I should think how God tells me to think about this. Mm -mm. Many foolish and hurtful lusts. Your lusts are going to be the ones that, that run you. Which drown men in destruction and perdition. Perdition means a down, downward spiral of sin. Verse 10. Now it's not money, because people misquote this verse. People say money is the root of all evil. No, it's not. It's the love of it. Verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. You ever heard of this? With these politicians, if something don't make sense, you just say, follow the money. Follow the bucks. Yeah. If it don't make sense, somebody getting paid somewhere. That's called government bureaucracy. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they've erred from the faith. All those health, wealth, prosperity preachers and all that, the reason they won't teach you Paul's epistles is because you ain't going to get rich teaching this message, not down here. You think they're going to have a box right there that most people just forget about? Uh-uh. They're going to pass that they're going to put that, that thing right there in front of you, like, like that, two or three times with the music, I'm telling you, for the Baptist church. They're going to have building fun up there, people who gay, got your name, $100, yeah, I know, I know all the tricks they use. They don't care about this truth, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. And those men, if they're saved, the ones who are doing, when they get that judgment to Christ, if you're using God's word for financial gain, filthy lucre, it's lucrative, religion. God's going to get you. Okay? So, verse, verse 17 again. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. Remember the rich young ruler? Mm -hmm. He was doing everything the Lord said. The Lord told him one thing. He says, you, you're doing good now, young man. He says, what do I like, Lord? He goes, sell all that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. So you got to sell all. If you didn't sell all, you couldn't be his disciple. Guarantee you, ain't no preachers teaching that. Jesus said, sell all. Because they had to start with themselves, see? And they got Mercedes and, 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 and <laughs> private jets and stuff, making $92 million a year. <laughs> Listen, uncertain riches. Those riches are uncertain because they don't, there's no, I don't want to say this, there's no assurity that you're going to keep them. I'm going to read, for time's sake, Proverbs 11, 28 says, He that trusteth in his riches shall fall but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. The Lord said how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom. That guy left when Jesus told him to sell all. Somebody, some sister visited us from, I think, New York. I think that was. I can't remember. People come visit. And she made a good statement during the Q&A. She says, you ever thought that that rich young ruler was Saul of Tarsus? Uh -huh. the, the Apostle Paul. A couple of things. He was... He, was, he had profited in the Jews' religion among many as equal among his own nation. He was a young man named Saul. He was a young ruler. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and he, he did come into contact with Jesus of Nazareth. And I said, you know, I never thought about it, but that could be interesting. We would never know for sure, but what if that rich young ruler was Saul, mm -hmm. who had a heart to come, but got to a point where he heard some truth, he just couldn't go over. Therefore, he was, he was being convicted because you can see on the road to Damascus, he says, who art thou, Lord? He says, it's hard. Yeah. Keep his he goes, who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus. And he, he gave in. What if that rich young ruler was Saul? 
Interesting. Sounds right. It's just interesting character, okay? All right. Don't be high-minded. Oh, yeah, let me read it. So he says, in Jeremiah 9, 23, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Don't let the rich man glory in his riches. They do. They do. In Luke 12, there's a parable about a, a, a guy who was so rich, he had so much abundance, he says, man, I'm going to tear down my old stuff and make greater. And then God calls him, he said, hey, thou fool, I'm calling for your soul tonight. Mm -hmm. Then where your rich is going to go, the Lord says to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 23, 4 and 5, labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is nothing? For riches certainly make themselves wings. You know that commercial Red Bull gives you wings? That's what happens with your uncertain riches. <laughs> that's what the Bible says. That's Proverbs 23, 4 and 5. For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward the heaven. The Lord says, labor not for the, for the treasure that's down here, that moth and rust, uh, rust corrupt, but, but have your treasure in heaven, right? Where moth and rust and thief cannot get to that. See, Paul's going to say the same thing as we come down in. Notice what he says in verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. It's, not, it's nothing wrong with having money. I mean, the body of Christ needs some people that most of us are going to be poor as dirt and can't do much, but God does put some people with means to fund the ministry, okay? And everybody gives their little part, okay? But there are people who have finances who can help. So, notice he says, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Put your trust in God. That's what Jeremiah says, trust in the Lord. Who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Sometimes people think about Christendom or Christianity, uh, how worldly, and it's all about these following rules and just being in the closet, praying your prayer closet 24-7, I pray to. No. God wants the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and this life, abundant as he calls it, he wants the, 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 the light of the, the, the Lord to, to shine through people. And God has given us a creation, although it's been marred by sin and curse for 6,000 plus years, he's given us to enjoy. So he wants you to enjoy it in, how do I want to say, in moderation, am I right? Mm -hmm. Use the world, not abuse it. So he gives us things richly to enjoy. All right, verse 18, that they do good, and the title of our study, that they be rich. In, if you're going to be rich, be rich in good works. By the way, even if you're poor, you can be rich in good works. Yeah. You don't need money to go serve. Mm -hmm. People get caught up into themselves and their problems and their drama and all this stuff. And you know what I tell them? Once you start serving other people, mm -hmm. that'll get you out of all of that. Mm -hmm. Paul says... As we have therefore opportunity, Galatians 6, let us do good to all men, especially those in the household of faith. Just look for saints to bless. Notice what he says here. Rich in good works, ready to distribute. To distribute means to give out something among a particular group. Paul says in Romans 12, 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints. Get busy serving the Lord by serving one another. Willing to communicate. That's an old Elizabethan English word for sharing. You just look it up um, in the... Uh, Merriam-Webster, it says Old English, communicating to share. Share what you have, okay? So if you have this, the resources, share them. Now when you do that, verse 19, where we'll end, he says, laying up in store, a storehouse, right, for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. You know what he's, he's making reference to? The judgment seat of Christ. As you give back to the Lord now, to his saints, you're laying up a store house of reward there against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. And we saw that, that, that issue of laying hold on eternal life. Uh, go to verse 12. Verse Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Sometimes we use eternal life as everlasting life, but remember we saw that the eternal life has to do with a quality, a weight of glory. And as we serve the Lord now, we're laying up a foundation at the judgment seat of reward, okay? We'll, we'll end right here. Go, go to Philippians 4. Let me show you what Paul says. Like, even your giving, yes, you do it to fund the Father's work, but really, it's fruit abounds in your account. Paul makes it clear to Corinthians, he goes, he called God, he, you know, God calls it an experiment. He's testing it out. He's saying, let me see how they're going to, Prove the sincerity of love. 
And as people give, watch what Paul says. Verse number 10, Philippians 4, 10. We'll end in this passage. But I rejoiced in the Lord. Now when he calls on the Lord, what does it mean? The righteous judge. Greatly, that now at the last, your care of me hath flourished again. They were to take care of the Apostle Paul's needs. They did, they stopped, and then they started again. Wherein you were also careful, or you were attentive to it, but you lacked opportunity. Look how kind he is. He goes, yeah, you guys just lacked opportunity. I know you were trying to, but really they weren't. <laughs> See the kindness of Paul? You, you just lacked opportunity. That's the salesman in him. Do I have an opportunity for you? <laughs> it's, all, it's them going to get out of you and I have something for you. Verse number 11. Now, now this is true. Not that I speak in respect to a want. Paul says, I'm not asking you to give because of my want. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, that's down in the basement of low life. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed. He learned both to be full and to be hungry, both extremes, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, that spirit of Jesus Christ, the supply of the spirit of Christ. He's willing to suffer knowing the glory, which strengthened me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate. Remember what we saw communicate? You shared with me with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no, the Acts 16, no church communicator shared with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. They were the only ones who gave. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once again to my necessity. They say, Brother Paul's over there in another country. Let's send, to, let's send money for him. Now, what, here, let's end here. Not because I desire a gift. That wasn't the purpose. But he was thinking about them. But I desire fruit that may abound to your what? You have an account with the Lord. In everything you do to, to, to promote the grace message, your time, being here, your talent, using who you are, and your treasure, you share to fund it, all those things go to your account. You know how you put money in a bank, a bank account, checking account, savings account? There is another account. It's a reward account. And as you build into the ministry of grace, the Lord Jesus Christ repays you, recompenses you, rewards you for your labor at the judgment seat. That's why we're doing what we're doing. My job is to give you a, uh, I, I post audio studies in Romans and Mark on the, on the website now. And I started off, 10 minutes in the Word. I say, my job is to give you your, help you get your full reward at the judgment seat. That's my goal, like the Apostle Paul. I want fruit abound to your account, okay? Now, if you're, if you're not saved today, by the way, next week we're going to look at science. Paul's going to end the book by saying, science falsely so-called. That's going to be my title, science falsely. And I'm going to show you what the Bible says about science compared to what mankind says about science. Okay? Science is a real thing in the Bible, but it's not the way to man. I want you, we're going to look at that next week, get to end of verse 2. But if you're not saved today, there's only one place your soul is, you know, you, I, there's another treasure. In Romans, he says, you're treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. So when you're lost, you, you're treasuring up something in heaven too. Wrath. Uh -huh. And Jesus came to die so you wouldn't have to have that treasure of wrath. He came to set you free if you trust him, so now you can build a fruit to your account to reign in heaven with him. Don't treasure up wrath, Romans says. Treasure up a good foundation to the time to come, okay? But you got to get saved. And if you are saved, redeem the time. The days are short. Look at the world around you. The Lord's soon to come, all right? Let's get our full reward together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your marvelous grace to us in Christ, the one who suffered for this privilege of having a body, a member, uh, members of, of his body serve him now and forever. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to share, to communicate, uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ in these things to this lost world and to our saints, our brethren, brothers and sisters. Father, we just pray that the things we learn today, that they might take root in our hearts by faith and that they give us a greater appreciation and understanding of just who the Lord Jesus Christ is and what he is doing today and will do when he manifests his power and glory for both heaven and earth to see with no doubt. 
He'll be the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lords of the Lord. We, we, look, we look forward to that day, Father. Uh, we ask that you haste it and, and, and expedite it. But until then, we're willing to be patient, trusting your holy word. As we have our Q&A, we ask you to bless that time together. For those who, who have to leave, we ask that you uh, bless their days through your grace. We thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen.